As you have probably guessed, this morning we are celebrating the Sacrament of Communion, uh, something we do every month on the fourth Sunday of each month. We partake in communion together. Uh, This morning, we're going to take a closer look at it with the goal of walking away with a greater understanding and appreciation for communion. Uh, The scripture for this morning is Mark 14, verses 12 to 26. Uh, You can turn to Mark 14 in your Bibles. Mark is the second book in the New Testament. You can also look up Mark 14 on your phones. Uh, But Jesus established the sacrament of communion at the Last Supper. Uh, Last Supper is recorded in all the Gospels, and the Apostle Paul also gives a summary of it in 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, We will be reading the account from the Gospel of Mark. Our scripture reader for this morning is Marvin Barnes. And so Marvin, please make your way on up. As he does, I'm going to ask you to please stand back up and face the center of the room. And we read from the center of the room to remind us that scripture is to be central in our lives. And we stand because we believe that this is the word of God. And so Marvin, whenever you are ready, please read from Mark chapter 14. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man with a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asked, Where is my guest room, and where may I eat Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at table and eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, the one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better off for him had he not be born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, for which has been poured out for many, he said to them, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they all went out to the Mount of Olives. Marvin, thank you very much. You may be seated. All of us have been handed down certain traditions, habits or behaviors that have been passed down to us. Now, sometimes we practice traditions without knowing why or without knowing where the tradition came from. For example, we are celebrating Thanksgiving this week, and most, if not all of us, are going to be eating turkey on Thanksgiving. Now, have you ever wondered why we eat turkey on Thanksgiving? Why not steak or chicken or pork chops? Why turkey? Now, I did some research to find out. Now, there is no evidence to suggest that Turkey was a part of the first Thanksgiving. However, in the 19th century, there were a few factors that led to Turkey becoming the main dish of the Thanksgiving meal. In the the 1820s, a novel called Northwood was written in which a turkey was highlighted as the main course of a Thanksgiving meal. And then about 20 years later, Charles Dickinson's A Christmas Carol featured a turkey as the centerpiece of a holiday meal. Um, Now, in the 1800s, turkeys were also in abundance. There were lots of them. They were relatively affordable, and they were big enough to feed a whole family. So there isn't necessarily 
a great story behind why we eat turkey at Thanksgiving. It pretty much was a result of cultural influence and economics. But when President Lincoln proclaimed Thanksgiving as a national holiday, it exploded in popularity and practice, and turkeys became as central to the holiday as the pilgrims and Native Americans, and we've been eating turkey on Thanksgiving ever since. Now, in honor of that tradition, here are some quick turkey facts that you can share with your families on Thursday, just to show how smart you are, okay? So, wild turkeys can fly, but domestic turkeys can't. A live turkey can run up to 20 miles per hour, but a dead turkey can't. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin proposed the turkey as the national bird over the bald eagle. That's true. Uh, 46 million turkeys are eaten each year for Thanksgiving, and presidential pardons for turkeys started with George H.W. Bush in 1989. Now, communion has been a part of church tradition and practice pretty much from the beginning. And why is that the case? While most of us know that it was established at the Last Supper, we may not know all the reasons why we celebrate communion. And whether it is a weekly practice or a practice just a couple times a year, all Christian traditions include the practice of communion. So let's take a closer look at communion to remind ourselves why we do this. And the first reason we do this is because it builds our faith. Going back to verse 12. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him and say to the owner of the house that he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went to the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. Last Supper took place during Passover. Now, Passover, or the Festival of Unleavened Bread, was when the Jewish people remembered God rescuing them out of slavery in Egypt. Through the ten plagues and the parting of the sea, God rescued them. And he told them, he commanded them to celebrate the Passover as a way of remembering. And the Jewish people celebrate Passover to this very day. Now, back in Jesus' time, it had to be celebrated in Jerusalem. So Jesus either has a disciple or a friend in Jerusalem who has a place where him and his disciples can celebrate the Passover. And that is where he sends his disciples to prepare the room for the meal. And preparing the Passover would have included things like um, getting the lamb, getting the bitter herbs, bread, wine, preparing all those things. And by celebrating it every year, it built the faith of the Israelites. Because in Jesus' time, Israel was under Roman occupation. The Passover reminded them of God's deliverance from slavery, from Egypt, and at that time, the Egyptians were the superpower of the world. So it gave them hope that God would deliver them from the Romans, who were at that time the current superpower of the world. And if nothing else, it was a reminder that God had not forgotten them, that even though the Romans occupied their land, he was still with them. He remembered them in Egypt. He was going to remember them now as well. Now, whenever I explain the purpose of the sacraments, I always ask a question. I say, why do we come to listen to the Word of God? Why do we do that? And the response I get from people when I ask that question are things like, well, it encourages my faith, or it builds my faith, or it reminds me of who God is and what God has done. And all those things are true. And all those things are also the reasons why we celebrate communion. We celebrate communion because it encourages, us, it encourages us in our faith. It builds our faith. It reminds us of who God is and what God does. Communion recenters our faith. 
And we remember what Christ did on the cross in the past. And while there is that element of remembering the past, there is also a present and future aspect of communion. Because in the present, we commune with Christ and one another. And for the future, we are given hope as we look for Jesus' second coming. And so communion, it recenters our faith by remembering the past, communing together in the present, and having hope for the future. Now, the Word of God, it builds our faith with words. Again, the Word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. However, words are abstract. Much of our faith is believing theological truths, like Jesus died for our sins, Jesus rose from the dead. Those words are true. But sometimes we need something more concrete. And communion gives us something concrete to anchor us in our faith. God didn't just give us his words to build our faith. He also gave us sacraments. And sacraments are tangible. In communion, God has painted a picture of his promises to us. But it's not a picture that we just look at. We participate in it. Coming to the table, receiving the elements, partaking in them together, we are participating in an event that symbolizes our faith. There's even significance in the fact that we eat in the sacrament. We all know the saying, you are what you eat. Well, when we eat the bread and drink the juice, we are consuming a symbol of what we believe. And you may remember the significance of eating from the Garden of Eden. You see, Adam and Eve didn't sin when they took the fruit from the tree. Adam and Eve didn't sin until they ate the fruit. Likewise, when we partake in the elements of communion, we consume the symbol of our faith, and communion connects us to our faith in a unique way. And like the Word of God, communion reminds us of our identity in Jesus. Now, my common title, what most of you will call me, is Pastor, Pastor Chuck. My official title is Minister of the Word and Sacrament. Please don't call me Minister of the Word and Sacrament Chuck. Pastor is fine. But my official title of Minister of the Word and Sacrament is because God has given us both the Word and the Sacrament to build our faith. So we celebrate communion to build our faith, but communion is also an invitation to us from God. Communion reminds us that God bids sinners to come to him. Going back to the passage in verse 17. When evening came, Jesus arrived at the twelve, and while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go, just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Jesus tells the twelve that one of them will betray him, and you notice their reactions. They did not all point the finger at Judas and say, it's him, isn't it? That's not what they did. They all took a look at themselves. And one by one, all of them asked him, surely you don't mean me. It was a moment of introspection because each and every one of them thought they had the potential to be the betrayer. And Jesus says, it's the one who dips bread into the bowl with him. 
Now, the bowl he's referring to is filled with bitter herbs. And the bitter herbs were a part of the Passover to remind the Israelites of the bitterness of their slavery in Egypt. But for Jesus, the bitter herbs are a literal foretaste of the bitterness of the cross. And for Judas, who who partook with him, it is a foretaste of the bitterness of betrayal. At the Last Supper, the disciples were well aware of their shortcomings and weaknesses. Again, they all thought they had the potential to be the betrayer. And yet, they were still invited to come. And God continues to call sinners to the table. Those who are aware of their shortcomings and weaknesses, those who are displeased with their sins. And that is an important point to remember. Communion is not for those who are proud of their sins. It is for those who are painfully aware of them, yet believe that their sins are forgiven. And that faith in forgiveness in Christ needs to be nourished. Not just through hearing about it, but seeing and touching and tasting. You see the tables in the middle of the room, and right now there is nothing on them. I'm going to ask the elders to make their way to the back of the room to prepare to set the tables. So elders, please stand up and go to the back of the room and just be prepared to set the tables. Um, Now, we're not going to be coming to the tables just yet. I just want you to see the table being set. And as they set the tables, we are going to sing a song together. And for those of us who have made a commitment to Christ and are a part of a faith community or looking for one, consider this song that we sing as an invitation. Again, don't come to the table just yet. Simply let the invitation sink in. So communion, it builds our faith, it bids sinners to come, and it brings us back to who we are. Going back to the passage in verse 22. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, take it, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Just as the Passover meal reminded the Israelites of God's covenant with them, reminding them that they were God's people, the Last Supper reminds us of the new covenant Jesus made in his blood. And it brings us back to the forgiveness and healing in Jesus. And we are reminded of what we were created for in the first place. We were not created to do whatever we feel like doing. Doing whatever we feel like doing isn't freedom. Doing whatever we want to do is slavery. Because when we simply do whatever we want, and that dictates our lives, we are slaves to our desires. And we weren't created to be slaves to our desires. We were created to love God and one another in Christ. Loving God and our neighbor should be the center of our identity. Freedom is being in harmony with God and our neighbor It is not the freedom from restrictions to do whatever we feel like doing. Healing isn't so that we can get better and then go on our own way. But healing is being redirected to loving God and neighbor. Healing is getting back on the right path. 
after we get the elements and we sit with them, and as we sit with them, it helps us reflect upon our lives because it reminds us that Jesus is here with us. And because we do this together, it unites us as the body of Christ. It's like a rallying cry for who we are and what we do, that Christ died for us so we live for him. And we look forward for when the kingdom of God is fulfilled in eternity. As Jesus said, I will not drink again until I drink it new in the kingdom of God, something we all look forward to. So we're going to come to the table a little different this morning. You see the tables in the middle of the room. And when I invite you to the table, simply go to the tables in the middle, take the elements you need, and bring them back to your seats. And then hold on to them, and we will partake in them together. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a free-for-all. Because we're not escort, you know, we're not going to tell you when you go, when you go, when you go. No, you all go in the middle at the same time. And we'll be walking around each other, getting in each other's way as we're getting to the table, as we are going back to our seats. It's going to be a little messy. But it's a good reminder. Because, you know, sometimes community can be messy. But feel free to greet people as you go to the table and return to your seats. Again, for those who have made a commitment to Christ and are a part of a faith community or looking for one, you are invited to come. And if you're unable to come to the table, simply raise your hand and get the attention of the elders, and they will serve you where you are seated. And it may take a little bit for them to get to you because of everyone who's going to be walking around. But raise your hand and they will come to you. And if you are at home, I encourage you to go ahead and get the elements ready in your home. As Jesus had his last supper with his disciples, the Lord Jesus, the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after they had eaten, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As you come to receive the elements, remember in Jesus we are united in our faith. Jesus knows our sins and he wants us to come to the table anyway. Don't let your sin keep you from coming. Confess it, receive forgiveness, come forward. Or not forward, come to the table in the middle. And allow this moment to remind you of the love of Christ, encourage you to return to a life of faithfulness. Jesus' sacrifice wasn't so that we would stay away. He died so we would come. And he again invites us to come to his table of grace. So come, for all things are now ready. Lord, as we come to your table this morning, we ask for you to use this moment to encourage us in our faith, and to spur us to do everything we say and do this week, ultimately for your glory. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So one last thought on communion. Communion begets Thanksgiving. This is Thanksgiving week, a time when we focus on what we have to be thankful for, but it's not quite the same as the Thanksgiving communion begets from us. In communion, the focus of our thanksgiving is not on all of our blessings. It's a thanksgiving for God saving our souls. Going back to the last verse of our passage, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Singing a hymn was a part of the Passover experience 
Reflecting on God's deliverance out of Egypt was an appropriate time to give thanks to God for his goodness. And just to be clear, it says they sang a hymn. The hymn they sang was not Amazing Grace or the Old Rugged Cross or How Great Thou Art. Those are great hymns. But those hymns were written 1,700, 1,800, 1,900 years later. The song they would have sung would have been likely a Passover song. And even though it had been 1,500 years since the deliverance from Egypt, they were still recognizing God's goodness to them, which is what communion does for us. Even though it's been 2,000 years since Jesus died on the cross for our sins, communion still elicits thanksgiving from us. We continue to recognize God's goodness to us in the death of his one and only son, Jesus. The building of our faith the bidding of sinners, bringing us back to our identity, the beginning of thanksgiving, all of these things that communion does, it recenters us. It recenters us on who God is and what God does, and it recenters us on who we are and what we are called to do and be. Our lives are not random and meaningless. We have been created for a purpose, yet we have lost our way in our sin. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, and we are called to persevere in the faith. Because Jesus died for our sins, Jesus rose from the dead, that actually happened, and it changes everything. Please pray with me. And Lord, again, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the salvation of our souls. May this moment ground us, anchor us in both who you are and who you have called us to be. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And as you go, receive God's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.